When Frances Fanny Crosby was six weeks old, her parents noticed that something was wrong with her eyes. With their family doctor out of town, they contacted a man that claimed to be a physician. He looked at the infant's eyes and decided to apply hot mustard poultices. The infection did eventually clear, but the harsh treatment tragically left white scars on her eyes and Fanny was permanently blinded. Her father passed away shortly after, and her mother went to work to provide for her blind daughter. But for God's glory, that was not the end of Fanny Crosby's story. She went on to become one of the most famous and beloved hymnists in the world, writing over 8,000 hymns. One of Fanny's dearest friends was Phoebe Knapp. While Fanny lived in the slums of Manhattan and worked in a rescue mission, Phoebe lived in a palatial residence in Brooklyn where she dressed and entertained lavishly. Her music room contained one of the finest collections of instruments in the country, and Fanny was a frequent house guest. One day in 1873, while Fanny was staying at the Knapp Mansion, Phoebe wanted to play a tune that had been running through her mind. Going to the music room, she sat at the piano and played the new composition while the blind hymnist listened. And then it happened. Fanny clapped her hands with joy and said, Why, Phoebe, that is blessed assurance. Within minutes, Fanny had composed the words, and one of the great hymns of worship was born. Many years later, the great preacher D.L. Moody and his music director, Iris Sankey, were preaching to large crowds in New York. They had popularized many of Fanny's hymns and made her name famous around the world. Yet Fanny refused to even be recognized publicly when she attended Moody's Crusades. At one such event, Fanny slipped in late to hear D.L. Moody speak. The church was packed and Fanny could not find a seat anywhere. Seeing what was happening, Moody's son raced off the stage to help her find a seat. To her bewilderment, she had been led onto the platform just as the crowd was singing Blessed Assurance. Moody Sr. jumped to his feet, raised his hand, and interrupted the singing. Praise the Lord, he shouted, here comes the authoress. Though Fanny was embarrassed, she gave a few short words to thank God for making her a blessing to so many. Then she reluctantly took her seat amid a thunderous ovation. Humble, gracious, and mightily used by God, that was Francis Fanny Crosby. Let us never forget that God can make all things work together for our good and his glory. Good morning. It's Sunday, May the 17th. Good to be with you once again. We're looking forward to being able to uh, get back together here uh, soon. In, in the next few weeks, I put out some, uh, by the time you're watching this, there should be uh, in your email some um, 
write-up that the board put together this week at our board meeting of uh, some precautions and some uh, a system of what we're going to do uh, once, once we go back. We're waiting really for the governor to go back to a yellow phase in York County. And uh, as soon as he gives us that, then we can get the ball rolling to get back together and to worship once again. And so um, if you have any questions about any of that, email me here at the church. We'll go over some of that or answer any questions you may have. Uh, but everything should be pretty self-explanatory uh, in what I wrote up there. And you should be able to have an idea of what, what the expectations are when we get back uh, together. Kind of go back together kind of slow, I guess. You know, take our time, figure it out, uh, extra cleaning to the church and extra time and everything's going to be a little a little different and some of the things we won't be able to do the way we, we did before at least for a little while uh, but hope you are patient with us and uh, we'll get the, the ball rolling here I'm hoping over the next couple of weeks today I want to continue with our series on the Sermon on the Mount and um, I did that a couple of weeks ago obviously I talked about Mother's Day last week on our Mother's Day Sunday uh, uh, opportunity there to uh, recognize mothers. I've preached a Mother's Day message. But I'm getting back to Matthew chapter 5 today and following with our series on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, today, a uh, very, um, uh, how do I want to say, a very unusual type of, of setup uh, in this passage as Jesus, again, is kind of covering point, point, point. Remember we did that a few weeks ago when we talked about the Beatitudes. Uh, and then the next week we talked about the, the salt and the light, the two examples he gave of us. And now today we're going to get into Jesus talking about the law and his perspective on the law. He's going to talk about that in particular. And then he's going to take different aspects of the law and teach it uh, in his modern time. And so, uh, you know, Jesus didn't come to wipe out the law. He's going to tell us he came to fulfill the law. And as he came to fulfill the law, he's going to talk about the law in the age of grace and uh, what God's expectations are on these different dynamic um, uh, institutes within the law. And so we're going to look at those today. I think you'll find uh, that uh, interesting, but we'll go down through that fairly quickly as we look at uh, some of the applications. Let's start in Matthew chapter 5, and I want to start in verse number 17. Matthew 5, 17. I'll read the first part of, of what I'm going to preach on today, and then we'll get to the rest of it as time allows. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth uh, pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled." Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. We'll pick up with verse 27 in a minute. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. Lord, I thank you for uh, the opportunity that we have. Lord, thank you for uh, the, the members of Cedar Hill Baptist Church, the time that we have. Lord, we may be geographically apart from one another, but we are together in spirit. And Lord, as our church family gathers around uh, the opportunity to watch the video today, the message uh, today, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, the Holy Spirit's not just active in the church sanctuary, Lord, he's active in our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that the Spirit will work and move in the lives of our congregation today as we come before the Word 
today. Lord, we look forward to uh, the coming weeks as we have an opportunity to come back together. Lord, it's going to be uh, a different time. It's going to be with restrictions. It's going to be very different. But Lord, it'll be a first step to getting back to some normalcy in our worship service. And so, Lord, we pray uh, that things will be expedited within the state government and that, Lord, we can get some things rolling here in the next couple of weeks to be able to worship once again. Lord, we pray for some in our church uh, that are going through some difficult times. Lord, I know there's some dealing with job situations, uh, with uh, income um, limitations right now uh, because of, of all that's going on. Uh, Lord, I, I know that there's been some that have had deaths in the family this past week. And so, Lord, all those that are, are struggling right now, Lord, we pray for them where they may be. Uh, that you'll encourage them, uh, wrap your arms of compassion and help and attention around them right now, Lord, as they're struggling with, with various things that have come their way, some that we're familiar with and some that we may not know. Lord, we thank you that you are ever uh, present in time of trouble. Lord, again, we ask now your blessing on the preaching of the word. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Starting in Matthew 5, 17, uh, the Lord begins to talk about the law. And that's really the theme down through the rest of the chapter as uh, Jesus Christ is coming. And again, this is a very transitional time, obviously. Uh, Jesus Christ is, is coming, and uh, we're, you and I are looking at this 2,000 years later. And we're looking at this as a transition between the age of the law and the age of grace. Uh, or the age of the law and the church age. Just a very transitional time, very different time. And Jesus is coming to, again in verse 17, don't think that I've come to destroy the law. It's not that it's null and void now. Jesus said, I'm coming to fulfill the law. And I think there is still a, a, a tendency today uh, in, in, our, in our teaching and preaching uh, to kind of disregard the law or put the law back or downplay the law. And Jesus is making it very clear in this teaching, in this uh, sermon that he's having to his followers on this day. He said, I'm not coming to get rid of the law. I'm coming to fulfill the law. And in doing so, he's then going to begin to talk about different aspects of the law. And I think we would agree there's a uh, heightened sense of responsibility in regards to each of the things he's going to teach. He's not downplaying them. In fact, he's heightening them. He's bringing them uh, to even further clarification. In fact, he's making them even maybe more difficult. And so we're going to get to that in just a second. As he begins to talk about this, he gives some familiar verses. Verse 18, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. And we talk about this verse a lot with inspiration of the scripture, that God has preserved his scripture. These are uh, doctrines that we hold to. These are things that are written in our constitution and bylaws uh, here at the church. Boy, these are things that we hold to. The, uh, the word will never pass away, and it's verbally inspired by God. It's been preserved by him down through the ages so that we can trust that which we are holding and reading today. Important doctrines. But in this particular context, Jesus is, is reminding them about the law. So I've not come to destroy the law. I'm coming to fulfill the law. And likewise, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle are gone. So don't throw away the law. Don't throw out the law. Don't throw out the law that I gave to Moses in the wilderness uh, as, the, as the nation of Israel was being formed. And I, God breathed that. The people of Israel lived by that. They've memorized it. Uh, it's been their rule of, of religion and law now for thousands of years as they've come to this point, a couple thousand years. And now Jesus is saying, we're not getting rid of that. That's not passing away. Uh, we're not throwing out the old to bring in the new. We're adding to. We're fulfilling the old. And so, again, the context here is Jesus is trying to make sure they don't just disregard everything they've heard, everything they've read, everything they've learned, everything that's been the foundation of their faith all the way up to this point. He's not getting rid of it. He's fulfilling it. In verse number 19, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, two important points here. Again, just as we're setting the foundation of the specifics that he's going to teach here in just a minute. 
It talks about teaching the law, teaching the word of God. Uh, number one, uh, if, if those who are teaching men to disregard or break any of it or throw it away, those who are teaching men to take one part of it and not apply it, I think we would agree this would apply to any of the word of God, any of the scripture, any of the Bible that's verbally inspired. If we're taking and teaching someone to throw it away or to disregard part of it or part of it's not applicable anymore or don't worry about that. We understand how some of it transitioned. We'll talk about that. But if we're telling people to disregard it or, or throw it away or, or not to do some of it, boy, there's a, there's a judgment for that in the kingdom to come. Likewise, those who, and I think it's interesting, he adds a word here, not only teach it, but do it. So that's uh, talking about the, the hypocrites, you know, do as I say, don't do as I do. No, 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 no. You got to do it and teach it. Uh, if you're teaching it, you better be doing it. You better be believing it enough uh, that it is active in your own life. And so uh, that's the one part of it, the teaching of it, the application of not only teaching it, but doing it, uh, and the punishment for if you don't do it. But he talks there again about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I've, I've taught this a couple times. I believe this is really important, uh, that we see that, again, what we do here on earth is going to have a great impact on the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign with Christ. I think too often we disregard that. Uh, it's, it, look, it's after the thousand-year reign with Christ, after the millennial kingdom, after that Jesus Christ rules and reigns on the throne of David. It's after that that he wipes away every tear. I, I believe that we will be forever in heaven without regret, but I believe we may well be a thousand years with Christ with regret. Be a thousand years with Christ where we've reaped the benefit or, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the effect of what we did upon this earth, good or bad. And so there's clearly some, some placement, some, some status, some position within the kingdom, within the thousand-year reign with Christ that's applicable. And we see it mentioned here. Uh, this, this is not talking about people who are unbelievers, who are teaching a false salvation, who are teaching something contrary to the word of God. This is someone who's teaching and, and disregards part of it or doesn't uh, um, uh, preach the whole counsel of God or removes part of it. Boy, there's a, there's a punishment for that. You'll be, Bible said, least in the kingdom. Those who teach it and do it will be greater in the kingdom. I think we see that with things like humility and pride as, as well, right? Uh, those who uh, vault themselves up will be least in the kingdom. Uh, the last shall be first. The first shall be last. We see that here. So we see that over and over again, This, especially in the book of Matthew. As Matthew is written to a predominantly Jewish audience and people with a, a strong um, history in the law and in their Jewish faith, uh, the kingdom was so important to them. Of course, they were looking for Jesus Christ to set up the kingdom right there when he was on earth, when he was walking. They were hoping to get rid of the Roman government. Let's start the kingdom now. Jesus is talking about the future kingdom to come. Uh, Israel will be the center of that. Christ will rule and reign in Jerusalem from the throne, the throne of David. Uh, Israel will be the center point of the world. We, as, as believers, have some position in that. I don't think that we understand all that's involved in that, but we have some position that we will, Bible says, rule and reign with him. How? Don't know. Where? Not sure. But there are some cautions, things that we need to be careful of, things we have to be uh, aware of as we go down through here, things that we have to put some uh, uh, alerted to as we go down through here. And so we see that, I think, uh, there through verse 19. Starting in verse number 20, Jesus says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen, uh, Jesus had called the Pharisees whited sepulchers. They were doing everything right on the outside, but inwardly there was a big problem. Inwardly there was sin. Inwardly they weren't right with God. Inwardly uh, they, they're, they're, they were far from God. Inwardly, many of them were not even believers, right? Many of them weren't believers. Uh, outwardly, they were doing all the right things. They were having the right, going through the right motions, uh, doing all the right actions. 
But inwardly, they were like, like Nicodemus was. They had no understanding of what was going on. They didn't really know God. They were just going through the motions of it. So Jesus said, your righteousness needs to be higher than that. And we know what that higher righteousness is. We need not the righteousness of the Pharisees, not the righteousness of keeping the law. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is only available through faith in Christ and Christ alone. We are cloaked with the righteousness of him. My righteousness, the Bible says, filthy rags. It's worthless. It's good for nothing. We must have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not by my works. It's not what I do, lest anyone boast. It's only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, starting in verse number 21, I began to read some of those verses a few minutes ago. But starting in verse number 21, Jesus begins to take a bunch of points from the law. Things that the Israelites knew so well. Things that they were so familiar with. Things that they could quote. Things they had memorized. Things that they lived by. This was not new for them. He began to take those points. So, much like the beginning of chapter 5, when he was talking about the Beatitudes... Blessed are they which, blessed are they which, these shall inherit, boy, point, 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 point. He's going to kind of do that here with different aspects of the law. He's teaching kind of a concise message here. Think about this. Jesus Christ on the mount teaching his disciples, teaching them, uh, I think we would agree, these three chapters we have, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but teaching them a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Uh, he's given them point, point, point. He did that with the Beatitudes. Now he's doing that here with the law. You've heard this, that's true, but it's even more than that. And I don't think that's what the uh, disciples were expecting at this point, right? I don't think his followers were expecting that. Uh, they were expecting, boy, uh, as they begin to understand that we're moving to the age of grace and Christ was here, and uh, is he coming to get rid of the law? No, he said that. I'm not getting rid of the law. I'm here to fulfill the law. And so here's the law as you understand it, and I'm actually going to add to it. I'm actually going to make it even stronger, even even more. I think that surprised him. So let's look at him very quickly here as we go down through here. Verse 21, you heard that it was said by them of old time, this is the law you know, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17, just some of the passages that specifically give that commandment. We know that, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. They got it, they know that. Absolutely, they're all shaking their head. But I say unto you, uh oh, verse 22, I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He goes on to a little bit more there in verse 22 as he talks about that, talks about the problem with anger, uh, anger being the root cause of murder and killing, angry with someone, angry about something, angry because of someone, and you lash out and you take a life. I think that's the, uh, I think we would agree here on earth, that is the ultimate um, reaction to anger. So bear with me here. We don't just out of nowhere kill someone. It begins with a feeling. It begins with anger. It begins with resentment. It may grow very quickly, right? There are people who, who very quickly find out something, get mad, and retaliate. It happens within one fight. It happens within one moment. But there are others, and maybe even more often, we find out about something, and we, we think about it, and we dwell on it, uh, and it builds up, and it builds up, and the anger becomes wrath and bitterness until we retaliate and lash out with the ultimate uh, uh, betrayal of someone, the ultimate reaction of someone, and we, we, we commit murder. Uh, listen, it started with the anger. Whether it grew very quickly or whether it ceased and raged in our lives for a long time, it started with anger. And so Jesus is going back and dealing with the root problem. In other words, think about this. Think about who he's talking about and who he's talking to. He just talked about the Pharisees. Your righteousness, he said, better be better than the righteousness of the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees were looking at themselves and they're like, Bible says don't kill. I'm good, never killed anybody. Jesus says, yeah, but how about the anger? How about the anger that's dwelling in your soul? How about the anger that you have towards someone? How about the resentment that you have? How about the bitterness? 
of that situation that continues to boil and continues to dwell and continues to seethe inside you and you think about it and you dwell on it and it gets you all worked up and day after day the anger continues to boil. Jesus said, let's talk about that. You're worried about the, the murderer being uh, in, in uh, the judgment of, of, of hellfire and wrath to come because of murder. Jesus said, I say the anger is just as bad. The anger is the root cause of that. The anger is the problem. Well, I don't think the disciples knew how to handle that. At first, right? I don't think the disciples knew what to do with that. They, they had heard this level of the law, don't kill. Okay, that's, I, I'm going to say this, but that's pretty easy, right? Most of us have, <laughs> have never had a problem uh, worried about killing someone. We've never gone to that extent. That's an extreme reaction to a serious problem. And so most of them can sit there like, well, I never killed anybody. Jesus said, well, how about your anger? You're angry with someone? You're angry with someone without cause? You're angry with someone and it's just building up and brewing in your life and boiling over? Well, well that may be something that's a lot more prevalent among people. I think the disciples understood that. Um, starting in verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Again, they got that. They know that. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it far from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it is prof profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And so again, a, a topic that they're familiar with from the law, adultery, in verse number 27. Again, uh, uh, the law talks about this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18, right here in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said in verse 28, that's true, adultery is wrong. I say unto you, if you look on a woman to lust after her, it's the same thing. Well, that, that upped the responsibility here. Uh, that upped the... Uh, uh, conviction in their, in their hearts. Well, you know, it was one thing to commit adultery. It was another thing to look and to lust. It was something internal. Remember, just like uh, with the anger in the verses before, you could keep the anger inside and kind of keep it hidden, and it didn't seem to affect anybody. It does affect other people, but you can kind of contain it and think it doesn't affect everyone. Same with this. You commit adultery, well, now we have someone else involved, and you may have their family involved, and their spouse involved, and their children involved, and it affects a lot of people. But the lust, you can keep inside. You can keep that hidden. You can keep that away from people. And so that was more personal, more internal. And the disciples, again, this was taken uh, uh, responsibilities and the law and the standard that they had applied in their lives and moved it to a whole new level now. They weren't sure what to do with all this. This had really changed it. Jesus followed up this particular example, the adul adul adultery and lust. He followed that up with these two examples. And uh, we're familiar with these. I think it's a, uh, putting it in place here uh, highlights the emphasis that Jesus put on it. Verse 29, if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. Verse 30, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Uh, those are, sound like extreme measures. And yet, I think Jesus is very clearly teaching here the importance of dealing with sin in our lives. Uh, if you're going to be tempted by it, get rid of it. Move away. Get it out of the area. Get it out of your house. Get it away from you. Uh, if, if that thing's going to offend you, if that thing's going to be a problem for you, if that thing is going to continue to drag you down and destroy your life, get rid of it. Move it to the extent of your eye offends you, get rid of it. It'd be better not to have the eye than to deal with the effect of the, of the lust that would lead to adultery, that would destroy your testimony. If your hand offends thee, this is the extreme. This is the extreme measure of what Jesus is saying we should do with temptation in our lives. Get rid of it. Avoid it. You're, uh, uh, you're, you're around people that are dragging you down, get away from them. Uh, you have a problem with uh, uh, certain things on the computer, throw the computer away. Get rid of the smartphone. Get rid of the stuff that's just uh, affecting your testimony, affecting your mind, affecting your walk for Christ. Get rid of it. 
Jesus talks about uh, us dealing with that in a very direct way. Starting in verse 31, he moves on to the next one, the third one we're looking at today, and that is oaths. Verse 31, it's been said, whosoever shall put away uh, his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard that it has been said of them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by the head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Starting in verse uh, 33 down through verse 37, he's talking about the subject of oaths and swearing. Um, I think this is very uh, clear and, and, and very easily understood. Uh, let your word stand for itself. Uh, don't, don't have to back things up by, oh, I swear, you know, what do we say today? You know, I swear on my grandmother's grave and all kinds. No, 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 no. Let your word stand for itself. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Let people know that you uh, mean what you say. Uh, the kids... Uh, uh, when, when they say something, the kids want to pinky swear, right? Pinky swear. Uh, no, we, we don't need to. Let, let, let what you say be the case, be the truth. Uh, don't have to back it up. Don't have to verify it. Don't have to sign it away. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And then Jesus talks about retaliation. In verse 38, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I say unto you that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, two miles. Give to him that askest thee, from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And so from verse 38 to 42, uh, he talks about retaliation, eye for an eye. Uh, again, that's from Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. Uh, 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 um, that, uh, that feeling that we have that when someone does something to us, we need to retaliate. We need to get revenge. We need to get something back. The Bible tells us, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Uh, he's the one that will take care of being uh, of the... Uh, um, He's the one, Jesus Christ is the one uh, that will work those things out, uh, that will make sure that uh, the, the just thing is done and complete. That's not for us to do. And so we worry about eye for an eye, and I think, again, this is written in the law, and people were, boy, people were holding on to that. Eye for an eye, I'm coming to get my just reward, I'm coming to get what's owed me, I'm coming to get what's due me, I'm coming to retaliate because of that. And Jesus said, how about if you just go the extra mile? And turn the other cheek. It's a better reaction to it. Let the Lord take care of the revenge. Let the Lord take care of making sure what is just and what is right. And we do the right thing and go the extra mile. It's a whole different perspective on this. Again, Jesus is talking about the righteousness of the Pharisees, the law that they understand, the law that they've been taught. And he says, let's take it to a different level. So again, they come thinking, boy, I guess Jesus is here to get rid of the law. Maybe we don't have to follow any of it anymore. Maybe it's gone. And Jesus said, oh, I didn't come to get rid of it. I've come to fulfill it. In fact, here's some specific points. And this is the fourth one we've looked at today. We're going to look at five. The fourth one that he looks at is, you say, uh, or you've heard through the years, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, you've heard you know, about making an oath and an eye for an eye. And I'm saying, let's raise that to a higher level. Don't be in anger. Don't lust. Let your yea be yea. Go the extra mile. It's, it's, it's taking what they had known and, and increasing it. Boy, that's, again, I think that was a, a change for them. It may be, may be something for us to think about too. In the age of grace, we tend to want to downplay the law. Jesus gives a heightened 
sense of responsibility to it. So one more, relationships, verse 43, down through the end of the chapter. You've heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brothers only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And so he talks about the fact of not only loving those that are lovable, but loving those that are unlovable in our lives. And so loving those that are family, that reciprocate that love, that love us back, the Bible says that's, that's easy to do. That's easy to do. We're, we're, there's no uh, uh, great obstacle to that. That should come naturally. How about loving you, those that are not so lovable? How about loving those that don't like you, that persecute you, that hate you? Uh, that love of Christ should be extended to all, not just those that we pick and choose that fit our criteria. And so again, he takes that which they had known so well and makes it broader, uh, makes it wider, uh, makes it something even more for them to attain to. And that is to love those that are even unlovable. He ends in verse 48 with setting the bar as high as possible. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, obviously we're, 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 um, we're mortal men with sinful natures. Uh, thank goodness for the love of Christ uh, that cloaks us in the righteousness of Christ, but we still fall short. But our standard is set pretty high. The perfection of God is the standard that God has given us, that Christ gave us to attain to. So, Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. End of chapter number 5, the Lord is just talking about the law, the application of the law, not to get rid of it, uh, but that we are even more responsible for it than ever before. There's so much of it. Now listen, some of those we know has, has changed or modified in the church age. Um, in the, under the law, they worshiped on the Sabbath. Uh, in the New Testament church, we worship the first day of the week. There's still a day set aside for worship. Uh, it's been modified. Uh, Jesus took these aspects of the law and heightened them um, and uh, uh, not, not to make them um, uh, go away or obsolete, uh, but to make them prevalent in our lives that we deal with often the root issues, not just the external issues that come from the heart. I hope that's helpful today. We'll pick up with chapter number six next week as we continue with our series on the Sermon on the Mount. I hope that we can learn and grow together as we go through these three important chapters where Jesus is one-on-one -on -one teaching his followers these important truths uh, point by point by point We'll do the same as we look at this again next week. Thanks for joining us today.